The hard fact in archaeology is that most of us don't have the talent to find a site like Gobekli Tepe, let alone excavate it properly and interpret it. Most of us dig on sites like um, this site in Sicily, where I excavated most, my most recent project, which uh, was a very, very ordinary ancient village, which is the, the whole reason why we went there. Because more than a hundred years of field work now on ordinary kinds of sites, as well as the really spectacular ones around the world, have produced a, a wealth of archaeological evidence. Literally billions of artifacts have accumulated. Museum storerooms all over the world are just bulging with stuff. And not only do we have billions of objects to work with, we've also had a real revolution in the kind of techniques available to us, of new natural science techniques that change the whole way we can look at this evidence. I mean, over here, this sort of space alien stuff you see uh, on the left, this is ancient pollen remains, hugely magnified, important source of evidence about diet. Here you see the extraction of ice cores um, from Antarctica, major source of evidence for ancient climate change. The new scientific techniques combined with the billions of artifacts now available and then we feed them back into the more traditional sorts of literary evidence and here we've got a papyrus of the beginning of the uh, the New Testament book of Matthew put all these pieces of evidence together collectively they make an incredible source which has begun to transform the way we think about the fall of civilizations even the fall of kind of the, the, the mother of all falls of civilizations, the collapse of ancient Rome. Seen here, a couple of absolutely magnificent paintings from the 1830s. Collapse, so this was destruction and desolation by a, an American artist named Thomas Cole. You know, people have been thinking about the fall of Rome for centuries and centuries. There was a, a German book published 30 years ago which listed more than 200 theories that have been put forward for why the Roman Empire fell. And in the last 30 years, we've accumulated so much evidence that we've now got to the point that instead of just adding more theories, we're actually able to start winnowing down the number of theories, getting down a little bit from the, 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 the 200. And the sort of things that we are now beginning to put together about the fall of ancient Rome, right? one of them is driven by new techniques of excavation. This is a reconstruction of a post-Roman village in England, uh, dating to the 7th and 8th centuries. When I started in this field in the 1970s, one of my first first digs was on a, a post-Roman site and back in those days we would have been really lucky to have known how to recover the traces of buildings like this. Now we have enormous amounts of evidence from these settlements and we're beginning to realize things like the, the, the old theories about the, the barbarian invasions of Rome. The numbers of people involved were much, much smaller than we thought. Over here on the right, I would see an ancient DNA lab, which is one of the main ways we've been able to figure out. The numbers of people involved, much smaller. The movements of populations, much, much slower than we'd previously thought. Um, from the evidence like tree rings, we now understand the role of climate was much bigger in the collapse of the Roman Empire than anyone had ever guessed. So too the role of disease. Here we've got a, a plague pit excavation going on in France. Many new sources of evidence beginning to change our picture of how the Roman Empire fell. Um, and also, we're able to put together a new understanding of the fall of the Roman Empire with similar sorts of evidence from more and more ancient collapses around the world. And on this slide, we've just got a 2,000-year span across you know, half the way around the planet of the collapse of other ancient civilizations. Here we've got Knossos on Crete. There's a great collapse in the East Mediterranean around 1200 BC. And over here, about 2,000 years later, the Maya site of Tikal. We've got this huge comparison set now to compare all the different ancient collapses and ask ourselves whether we can begin to draw out some general theories about how civilizations collapse. And actually we can go all the way back to about 2200 BC with this sort of analysis now. The collapse of um, the Akkadian Empire in what's now Iraq. And it's a site called Tel Leilan, which is you see right up at the top on the map here, where in addition to the usual sorts of things like great, great palace remains were dug up there. Also, this was the first site um, in Iraq where the study of of ancient soil sediments began to show that the collapse of this Akkadian Empire around 2200 BC seems to be driven very, very heavily by climate change. We've got a number of recurring features beginning to emerge. And in fact, in, in my own thinking about this problem, the collapse of civilizations, it seems to me that in every major collapse, we have basically five factors that almost always crop up. I like to um, call them the five horsemen of the apocalypse. They show up again and again. 
The first of them is major uncontrollable population movements, which kind of overwhelm what the societies of the day are able to deal with. Following on from that, and often driven by it, is the rise of major new epidemic diseases, often created by disease pools which had been separate, now being merged by the population movements. Coming along with the population movements, uh, epidemic diseases, also tend to get the collapse of states, state failure and increased warfare. On the back of state failure and increased warfare, you tend to get the collapse of trade routes and massive famines. And then the fifth factor, which is always in there, but always in a very complicated way in the mix, is climate change. And these five factors seem to show up in nearly all of the, the major ancient collapses. Now, if you, you, you're sort of go, dropping in on lots of different sessions um, here at Davos and the, the conference, um, you will, of course, find people talking about all five of the five horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, in fact, it's probably hard to go to a session where at least one or two of them are not going to come up. It's hard not to feel that we are now encountering some of the same kind of forces that have traditionally been involved in the fall of civilizations, uh, which uh, leads us to the question Susan raised, raised at the beginning, are we doomed? Well, it's tempting to say yes. Very easy to see uh, you know, a lot of recurring patterns. But this is where I think the, um, the new evidence we've got, archaeological evidence on the collapse of civilizations, this is where it begins to get really interesting. Because as well as cases like the end of the Akkadian Empire, where we see the five horsemen of the apocalypse riding, the civilization collapsing, we also have some cases where we see all five horsemen of the apocalypse, but we don't see the civilization collapsing. And that, I think, you know, gives us the opportunity to compare and contrast and ask, well, what makes the difference? Why do some collapse and some don't in the face of the same set of forces? The sort of cases I'm thinking about, classic cases, I'd say Rome in the third century AD, uh, 200 years before the Western Empire actually falls, all five horsemen of the apocalypse very clearly present in the third century. But the empire doesn't collapse. It bounces back. We get things like one of the great artworks of the Roman Empire, evidence for the invention of the bikini. Roman civilization did not collapse. This is from the fourth century site of Piazza Armarina in Sicily. Out in China, early seventh century AD, the, the end of the Sui dynasty, beginning of the Tang dynasty, all five horsemen of the apocalypse present. The Tang dynasty does not collapse, bounces back. This is the wild goose pagoda from Xi'an, bounces back. More examples of this, 13th and 14th centuries AD in the old world, an age of catastrophe. It's the age of Genghis Khan and the Mongol invasions, the Black Death, which comes back recurring again across the 15th and 16th centuries. Here, another Sicilian representation of the Black Death. Terrible things happening, all five horsemen of the apocalypse, we don't see a collapse. So what makes for the difference? I think that, that is the interesting question here. And I think we can begin to see a pattern here too. Sometimes important factors are quite small. The, the decisions of individual statesmen can be hugely important. I mean, here we see the emperors Gao Tzu and over on the right, Taizong, early 7th century um, Tang Dynasty emperors in China. These were men who really understood the workings of steppe nomad society, made brilliant political and military moves, played a major part in averting the collapse of the Tang Dynasty before it even got going. So one conclusion I mean, you can safely draw is that really good leadership matters. Um, you know, here we are at a conference full of global leaders. I think the message of global leaders is try harder. Uh, this is what, what I think we, one of the things we learn. We also, though, I think see a couple of more systemic factors which come up again and again in the cases where we don't see the collapse of, ancient, uh, of great civilizations. Um, one of these is that a difference between the societies that collapse and those that don't tends to be the rate of economic growth. If the economies are growing faster than epidemics are wiping out the population and trade routes are collapsing, that is a major positive force for the civilization not collapsing. Second big thing is the role of violence. If the societies are able to contain people who think violence will solve their problems, they're much less likely to collapse. These are interesting conclusions to draw for, for thinking about our own situation in the 21st century. You're on a tightrope, basically, when the five horsemen of the apocalypse start riding. You're on a tightrope, and you're juggling all these different factors. And thinking about our own situation in the 21st century, the, the tightrope that you're walking, in our case, if 
two of the biggest forces that can help you avert the collapse of civilizations are sturdy rates of economic growth and the control of violence. Um, we, we do have a lot to worry about. The fact that the, the forces that have driven our economic growth, so here you see an example from Beijing, the forces that have driven our economic growth also seem to contribute massively to the building crisis in the 21st century. Our burning of fossil fuels has created one of the major challenges to our own century. It's like the, the tightrope is narrowing by virtue of trying to avoid uh, a sort of economic slowdown. We're kind of ramping up the pressures bearing down in our civilization. So the tightrope narrows. The other part of the narrowing tightrope is the fact that the, the weapons that we have now created mean we are in a position to have a collapse of civilization that goes far beyond any that has ever been seen before. The ancient Romans could not do this. We can. So um, thank you very much for listening.